How close to death did you come? We were there within single-digit weeks. 22 hours a day? Or like what, how many hours? I was working, yeah, so seven days a week, sleeping in the factory. Uh, I worked everywhere from the, I worked in the, I worked in the paint shop, general assembly, body shop. You ever worry about yourself imploding? Like it's just yeah, too yeah. much? Yeah, absolutely. No one should put this many hours into work. This is not good. And people should not work this hard. I'm not, they should not do this. This is too, it's very painful. Painful in what sense? It's because my, it hurts my brain and my heart. It hurts. I, 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 I really need to be preoccupied with something. Uh, and I, if, if I'm just sort of sitting there relaxing, I can only do that for a very short period of time, and then it becomes unbearable. Are you motivated <clears throat> beyond just profit motive and racking up dollars? And yeah, I, no, I'm a volunteer. I mean, I don't need the money. Um, there's nothing I, I mean, I, it's not like I'm sitting here saying, I wish I could buy such and such a thing. I could buy it. Um, I get paid minimum wage, actually. I don't even get overtime. I, I think it's, 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 it's very difficult to start companies and, and quite painful. Um, I think that's important to bear in mind. I don't know if that's, that's probably not encouraging. Um, it's much easier to, to get a job somewhere. Much, much easier. Much less stressful. You'll have more time for, for other things. But would you uh, be happier? Uh, no. I wouldn't be, I'd no. be unhappier. But it, it, so it's, it's really like, if, if, if you're sort of wired to, to, to do it, um, then, then you should do it, but, but not otherwise. Um, it's not, it's, you know, it's not gonna optimize your leisure time or anything like that. It's, it's gonna be extremely difficult and stressful. So you, you must feel compelled to do it. Um, let me put it this way. If you need inspiring words, don't do it. I mean, it's really hard starting a company. I mean, you have to basically be prepared to work constantly, um, you know, from when you wake up to when you when you go to sleep. Um, and you have to be willing to deal with um, a lot of difficult problems and thorny problems. Um, you have to be uh, willing to deal with an enormous amount of stress. Um, you just got to push yourself super, super hard. I, I, I wouldn't recommend it for most people. I certainly never expected to, 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 to see the level of success that, that's occurred um, because I, I'm, I'm actually an engineer, and, uh, but I discovered that in order to do the engineering that I want to do, I have to have my own company, otherwise somebody makes me do something I don't want to do. The odds of me coming into the rocket business, not knowing anything about rockets, not having ever built anything, I mean, um, I would have to be insane if I thought the odds were in my favor. Why even begin? Oh, when something is important enough, you do it even though flowers are not in your favor. How much of your personal fortune have you poured into this? A uh, hundred million dollars. A hundred million dollars yes. into something that you did not believe would work at the beginning. Yes. In 2008, the rocket company is not going well. You've no. had three failures. The car company is hemorrhaging money. Yeah. And the American economy has tanked in the worst recession since the Great Depression. Right. Uh, that, was, that was definitely at the worst year of my life. What was your biggest failure, and how did it change you? It, we, we almost did die at SpaceX, actually. So we, I budgeted for, for three flights. Um, I mean, technically, I, I did have a plan where I, I had, a, had, this, had the money from PayPal. I had like about $180 million from PayPal. And I thought, you know, I'll, I'll allocate half of that to SpaceX and Tesla and Solar City, and um, that should be fine. I'll have 90 million. Like it's just lots, you know. Uh, but but then what happened is um, things cost more and took longer than than I thought. So I had a choice of either put the rest of the money in or the companies are going to die. Um, and it's like so I, put, I ended up putting all the money in and, and borrowing money for rent from friends. You've said that this has been the toughest year for you, the most sort of taxing yeah. year for you. Like, why? Well, I mean, Tesla really faced a severe uh, thre threat of death uh, due to the Model 3 production ramp. Yes. Essentially, the, the company was bleeding money like crazy, and, and just if, if we didn't solve these problems in a very short period of time, uh, we would die. Uh, and it was extremely difficult to solve them. How close to death did you come? We were there within single-digit weeks. 22 hours a day, or like what, how many hours? I was working, yeah, so seven days a week, sleeping in the factory. Uh, I worked everywhere from the, I worked in the, I worked in the paint shop, 
General Assembly, body shop. You ever worry about yourself imploding? Like it's just yeah, too much? Yeah, absolutely. No one should put this many hours into work. This is not good. And people should not work this hard. I'm not, they should not do this. This is too, it's very painful. Painful in what sense? It's, it, hurts my, it hurts my brain and my heart. It hurts. This is not recommended for anyone. I just did it because if I didn't do it, then Tesla, good chance Tesla would die. When we started Tesla, I thought maybe our chance of success was 10%. That's not a lot, considering you invested a lot of money in the, in the company. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I can tell you my original plan um, was, I thought, okay, I had, I had like $180 million from my, percent, my portion of the sale of, of uh, PayPal. And I thought, you know, if I invest half of that uh, in creating these companies, then I still have the other half, which will be fine. Yeah. But of course, that's not how it worked out. We used up all the, that, the, the, you know, you invested uh, 100 million, then still need more money. Uh, and then there was the big recession of 2008 and 9. And in the end, I had to invest everything. And um, I had to, was borrowing money from friends to pay the rent. You were on the edge of actually I didn't, I didn't even own a house. Were you a little naive when you thought I'll just, I can easily build, build an electric car and, and a rocket? I didn't think it would be easy. Um, I th like I said, I thought they would probably fail. Um, but you know, like creating a company is almost like having a trial. So it's sort of like, how do you say your trial should not have food? So one, once you have the company, you have to feed it and nurse it yeah. and <laughs> take care of it, of it even if it, it ruins you. Yeah. But uh, suppose I'm, there were some tough times in uh, 2008 end of 2008. How did you get through that period of crisis? Yeah. Can we just break for a second? Sure, 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 of course. Yeah. You want to wait a little while? Man, yeah, I sure hope it was worth it. Sure hope so. Pardon me? Sure hope it was worth it. I think when I was, I don't know, five or six or something, I thought I was insane. It was just strange because it was clear that other people did not, would, their mind wasn't exploding with ideas. It was like, hmm, and strange. I don't think, I don't think you'd necessarily want to be me. People would like it that much. It's very hard to turn it off. It's like a never ending explosion all the time. When you had that third failure in a row, did you think, I need to pack this in? Never. Why not? I don't ever give up. I mean, I'd have to be dead or completely incapacitated. So many people tried to talk me out of starting a ride company. It was, it was crazy. What did they tell you? One good friend of mine collected a whole series of, of uh, videos of rockets blowing up and made me watch those. You just didn't want me to lose all my money. How did you figure you were gonna start a car company and be successful at it? Well, I, I didn't really think Tesla would be successful. I thought we would most likely fail. But I thought that we at least uh, could address the false perception that people had that an electric car had to be ugly and slow and, and boring like a golf cart. But you say you didn't expect the company to be successful, then why try? If something's important enough, you should try, even if the probable outcome is failure. It has actually been a very difficult journey, I have to say. Yeah. Um, my priority right now is to try to add some more uh, management uh, bench strength to Tesla in particular, so that um, I can take a vacation. <laughs> you know, in the last 12 years, I've only tried to take a week off twice. The first time I took a, w a week off, the Orbital Sciences rocket exploded and Richard Branson's rocket exploded in that same week. Second time I took a week off, my rocket exploded. <laughs> the lesson here is don't take a week off. Where does that come from or how do you think about 
making a decision when everyone tells you this is a crazy idea? Or where do you get the internal strength to do that? Well, first of all, I'd say I actually think I, I, think I fear, feel fear quite strongly. Um, so it's not as though I just have the absence of fear. I, I feel it quite strongly. Um, but there are just times when something is important enough, you believe in it enough, that you, you do it in spite of the fear. People shouldn't think, well, I feel fear about this and therefore I shouldn't do it. Um, it's normal to, be, to feel fear. Like you'd have to, there'd be something mentally wrong if you didn't feel fear. So, so I think that there's certain things that are necessary to ensure that the future is good. Um, and some of those things are in the long term having long term sustainable transport and sustainable energy generation. Um, and uh, to be a space bearing civilization and for humanity to be out there among the stars and be a multi planetary uh, species. Um, I mean, I think being a multi planet species and being out there among the stars is important for uh, the long term survival of humanity. And uh, that's one reason, kind of like life insurance for life collectively, life as we know it. Um, but then the part that I find personally most motivating is that it creates a sense of adventure and it makes people excited about the future. Um, you know, if you consider two futures, one where uh, we are forever confined to Earth until eventually something terrible happens, or another future where we are out there on many planets, maybe even going beyond the solar system. Um, I think that second version is incredibly exciting and inspiring, and there need to be reasons to get up in the morning. There's a lot of terrible things that are happening all over the world, all the time. Uh, there are lots of problems that need to get solved. There's lots of things that are, yeah, that are miserable and kind of get you down. But the, Life cannot just be about solving one miserable problem after another. Can't, that can't be the only thing. There need, to be, there need to be things that inspire you, that make you glad to, be, to wake up in the morning and be part of humanity. That's why we did this. You know, there are American heroes who don't like this idea. Neil Armstrong, Gene Cernan have both testified against commercial space flight in the way that you're developing it, and I wonder what you think of that. I was very sad to see that, uh, because those guys are, yeah, you know, th those guys are heroes of mine, so it's really tough. You know, I, I wish they would come and visit and, and see the hardware that we're doing here, and, and I think that would change their mind. They inspired you to do this, didn't they? Yes and to see them casting stones in your direction. It's difficult. Did you expect them to cheer you on? So they're hoping they would. What are you trying to prove to them? What I'm trying to do is, is to make a, a significant difference in, in space flight and, and, and help make space flight accessible to, to almost anyone. If you have an advice to the young people globally who want to be like Elon Musk, what's your advice to them? I think that probably they shouldn't want to be <laughs> you. <laughs> it, it, I think it sounds better than it is. Um, yeah, it's uh, not as much fun being me as you'd think. There's definitely, it could be worse for sure, <laughs> but it's, um, I, I'm not sure I would. I'm not sure I want to be me. Depending upon how well you want to do, and particularly if you're starting a company, you need to work super hard. So what, what does super hard mean? Uh, well, when my brother and I were starting our first company, uh, in, instead of getting an apartment, we just rented a, a small office and we slept on the couch. Uh, and we, we showered at the, the YMCA. And uh, we're, we're so hot up, we had just one computer. So the, 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 the website was up during the day, uh, and I was coding at night, seven days a week, all the time. Um, and I, I uh, sort of briefly had a girlfriend in that period, and in order to be with me, she had to sleep in the office. So uh, work hard, like, it, it, 
I mean, every waking hour. That's that's the the thing I would I would say. If if you particularly if you're starting a company, just work like hell. I mean, you just have to put in, you know, eighty hour, eighty to hundred hour weeks every week. And that's then a lot of work. That, that, that all those things improve the odds of success. Um, I mean, if, if 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 other people are putting in forty hour work weeks and you're putting in hundred hour work weeks, then even if uh, you're doing the same thing. You know that in in one year you will achieve what they achieve. You you will achieve in four months what it takes them a year to achieve. Trying to build a company and have it succeed is like eating glass and staring into the abyss. I mean, what tends to happen is it's sort of quite exciting for the first several months of starting a company, and then then reality sets in. Things don't go as well as planned. Customers aren't signing up. The technology or the product isn't working as well as you thought. Um, and um, and then can, that can sometimes be compounded by a recession, um, and uh, it can be very, very painful for several years. Um, so I think, um, frankly, starting a company, you, I would advise people to have a high pain tolerance. I think it's important that you really like whatever you're doing. Uh, if, if you don't like it, life is too short. If you like what you're doing, you think about it even when you're not working. I mean, you're, it'll just, it, it's, it's something that your mind is drawn to. But even if you're, if you're the best of the best, there's always a chance of failure. And, and if you don't like it, you, you just really can't make it work, I think. Then I'd say focus on, on signal over noise. Uh, a lot of companies get, get confused. They, they spend money on things that don't actually make the product better. So, for example, at, at Tesla, We've, we've never spent any money on advertising. Um, we, we put all of the money into R&D and, and manufacturing and design to try to make the car as good as possible. Um, and uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's the way to go. For, for any given company, just can, can keep thinking about, are these efforts that p people are, are expending, are they resulting in a better product or service? And if they're not, stop those efforts. Don't, don't just follow the trend. So um, you may have heard me say to, to, that it's good to think in terms of the, the physics approach of first principles, uh, which is rather than reasoning by analogy, you boil things down to the most fundamental truths you can imagine and you reason up from there. And this is a good way to figure out if, if, if something really makes sense or if it's just what everybody else is doing. What's your mission life? Why you do whatever you do? I think that there are certain things that are necessary to ensure that the future is good. Um, and the universe as we know it will dissipate into a fine mist of cold nothingness eventually. Like what are the th set of things that can be done to make the future better? I think that a future where we are a space-faring civilization and out there among the stars, this is very exciting. This makes me look forward to the future. This makes me want that future. There need to be things that make you look forward to waking up in the morning. You wake up in the morning, you look forward to the day, look forward to the future. In a future where we are a space-faring civilization and out there among the stars, I think that's very exciting. That is a thing we want. We're going to see what other planets are like and we're a multi-planet species and the scope and scale of consciousness has expanded across many civilizations and many planets and many star systems. This is a great future. This is a wonderful thing to me and that's what we should strive for. Whereas if, if you knew we would not be a space faring civilization but forever confined to Earth, this would not be a good future. That would be very sad, I think. How many how many things can you buy that you really love, that really give you joy? So rare, so rare. I wish there were more things. That's what we try to do, just make things that somebody loves. Something that can be helpful is fatalism, uh, to some degree. Um, if, you just, if you just accept the probabilities, um, then that diminishes fear. Uh, so, um, when starting SpaceX, I thought the odds of success were less than 10%. Um, and I just accepted that actually probably I would just lose, lose everything. Um, 
but that maybe we would make some progress. If we could just move the ball forward, even if we died, maybe some other company could pick up the baton and move and keep moving it forward. Um, so that would still do some good. Um, yeah, same with Tesla. I thought you know, the odds of a car company succeeding were extremely low. In creating these companies, we thought that we would be successful. Um, I thought that the most likely outcome was failure. Um, but, but it was still worth doing, even though the, the odds of success were low. In fact, even for, for, for SpaceX, the, originally what I started doing was not creating a rocket company, but, but actually was going to do um, a small mission to Mars, which was just a philanthropic mission where you would send a, a small greenhouse with seeds and dehydrated gel. And the, would, um, upon landing, hydrate the gel, and you'd have this cool picture of green plants on a red background. And the public tends to respond to precedence and superlative. So this would be the first life on Mars, the furthest that life's ever traveled. Um, and you'd have this great money shot of green plants on a red background. <laughs> so um, yeah, I thought that would, that would get people's attention. So, um, but, but the expectation for that was, was no return. So the expect, I, I thought we, we wouldn't get any, uh, you know, just spend the money on that and it wouldn't, wouldn't happen. Advice I'd give to people starting companies, to entrepreneurs in general, is um, r really focus on making a product that your customers love. Um, and it, it's so rare that you can buy a product and, and you love the product when you, when you bought it. The, this is, this is there are very few uh, things that fit into that category. And if you if you can come up with something like that, your your business will be successful for sure. I think uh, really um, an, an obsessive uh, nature with respect to the quality of the product. When I was young, I, I, uh, I didn't really know what I was going to do uh, when, I, when I got older. Um, people kept asking me, and, and, um, but, but then eventually I thought that the idea of inventing things would be, would be really cool. And the, the reason I thought that was because um, I, I read a quote from Arthur C. Clarke, which said that a um, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And, and that's really true. Um, if, you if you go back say 300 years, the things that we take for granted today uh, would be, you'd, you'd be burned at the stake for. Um, you know, being able to fly, um, that's crazy. Uh, being able to see over long distances, being able to communicate, um, and having access to all the world's information uh, instantly from almost anywhere on the earth. Um, this, is, this is stuff that, that really would be magic, that would be considered magic um, in, in times past. In fact, I think it actually goes beyond that because there are many things that we take for granted today that weren't even imagined in, in times past. They weren't even in the realm of magic. So it actually goes, goes beyond that. So I thought, well, you know, if, if, if I can do some of those things, basically if, if, if I can advance technology, then that, that's like magic and that would be really cool. Um, and the, the, I always had sort of a slight existential crisis because I was trying to figure out what does it all mean? Like, what's the purpose of things? And um, I came to the conclusion that if, if we can advance the, 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 the knowledge of the world, if we can do things that expand the scope and, and, and scale of consciousness, then we're better able to ask the right questions and become more enlightened. And, and that's really the only way forward. So, uh, so, so I, I, I studied uh, physics and business because I figured in order to do a lot of these things, you, you need to know how the universe works, and you need to know how, how, how the economy works. Um, and you also need to be able to bring a lot of people together to work with you to create something, because it's very difficult to do something as, as an individual if it's, if it's a significant technology. So I, uh, I originally came out to, to California to uh, try to figure out how to improve the energy density of, of um, uh, of, of electric vehicles, basically to, to try to figure out if there was an advanced capacitor that, that, that could serve as an alternative to batteries. And um, that was in 95, and uh, that's also when the internet uh, started to happen. And, and it, I, I, I thought, well, I can either uh, pursue this, tech, this technology where success may, be, may not be one of the possible outcomes, which is always tricky, um, or uh, participate in the internet and, and be, be part of it. When I interview somebody, I really just ask them to tell me the story of their career and what they, you know, what are some of the 
tougher problems that they dealt with, how they dealt with those, and um, how they made decisions at key transition points. And usually that's enough for me to get a very good gut feel about someone. And, um, and, and what I'm really looking for is evidence of exceptional ability. So um, did, did they face really difficult problems and overcome them? Um, and, and then of course you want to make sure that, that if, if there was some significant accomplishment, were they really responsible or was somebody else more responsible? And uh, usually the person who's had to struggle with the problem, they really understand it you know, they don't, and they don't forget <laughs> you know, if it was very difficult. So um, you can ask them detailed, very detailed questions about it and they will, they will know the answer. Whereas the person who was not truly responsible for um, that accomplishment uh, will not know the details. There's no need even to have a college degree at all, uh, or even high school. I mean, if somebody graduated from a great university, that may be an, indi that may be an indication that they will be capable of great things, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, if you look at, um, say, people like uh, Bill Gates or Larry Ellison, Steve Jobs, these guys didn't graduate from college. But if you had a chance to hire them, of course, that would be a good idea. So, you know, just looking just for evidence of exceptional ability. Um, and if there's a track record of exceptional achievement, then it's likely that that will continue into the future. What sort of things do you look for in people or in processes that make the workforce better? Well, I think the massive thing that can be done is to make sure your incentive structure is such that uh, innovation is rewarded and lack of innovation is punished. So there's got to be a carrot and a stick. So uh, if somebody is innovating um, and doing, ma making good, good progress, then they should be promoted sooner. Um, and if somebody is completely failing to innovate, um, not, not every role requires innovation, but uh, if they're in a role where innovation is should be happening and it's not happening, then they should either not be promoted or exited. And let me tell you, you'll get promoted. You'll get you'll, you'll you'll get innovation real fast. Does that carrot and stick approach help? Uh, do you think people be more risk averse or less risk averse? When trying different things, you, you, you've got to have some acceptance of failure. Failure must be an option. If failure is not an option, it's going to result in extremely conservative choices, and you, you, may, not, you may get something even worse than lack of innovation. Things may go backwards. What you really want is, you want reward and punishment to be, to be proportionate to the actions that you seek. So if, uh, if, if what you're seeking is innovation, then you should reward success and innovation, um, and only there should be minor consequences for lack of minor consequences for for trying and failing. Those should be minor. Um, with significant rewards for trying and succeeding. Minor consequences for trying and not succeeding, um, and big and, and major negative consequences for not trying. If you have that incentive structure, you will get innovation like you can't believe. People look like they have a much better life than they really do. People are posting pictures of when they're really happy. They're modifying those pictures to be better looking. Um, even if they're not modifying the pictures, they're at least selecting the pictures for the best lighting, the best angle. So people basically seem uh, uh, they're way better looking than they basically really are. Um, and they're way happier seeming than they really are. So if you look at everyone on Instagram, you might think, man, they're all these happy, beautiful people, and I'm not that good looking, and I'm not happy. So I must suck, you know, and that's gonna make people sad. When in fact, those people you think are super happy, actually, not that happy. Some of them are really depressed, they're very sad. Some of the happiest seeming people, actually some of the saddest people in reality. So I think, I think things like that can make people quite sad. This may sound corny, but love is the answer. Wouldn't hurt to have more love in the world. I think, you know, I think people should be nicer to each other and give, people, and give, give more credit to, to others 
and don't assume that they're mean until you know they're actually mean. You know, just, it's easy to demonize people. You're usually wrong about it. People are nicer than you think. Give people more credit.